Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 17 of Just Slap Podcast, the pound for pound number one tennis podcast in the world. Your host, Stephen Duca, Alex Makatsaria, and joined today by a very special guest. She is a registered dietitian nutritionist, board certified sports dietitian. She currently serves as a sports nutritionist consultant for the United States Tennis Association, World Wrestling Entertainment, and the University of Central Florida. Previously, she was the team dietitian for the Orlando Magic NBA team for 12 years. It is an absolute honor to introduce Tara Collingwood. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here with you guys. Steven, nice. that was that was a, a great intro. Thank we banged you. it out. There thank we go. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Tara, this is this is. I mean, we're in the presence of a true specialist here. Yes. yes. So this is this is big big uh, big episode. Um, Tara, thank you so much for joining us. Um, before we kind of get into you know the the details, the meat of the episode, mm -hmm. can we just can you kind of just talk about you know your start specifically in nutrition, specifically sports nutrition? Um, you know, what sparked your interest? Uh, you know, where did you begin? Where did you know? When did you know that kind of, you're going to kind of be pursuing this path? Um, so yeah, just, just yeah, a little absolutely. bit about your background. So, um, so I'm one of those rare individuals that actually knew kind of what I wanted to do when I went to college and never strayed. So I went to Purdue University and double majored in exercise physiology and dietetics, um, nutrition. And um, because at the time there really wasn't, sports nutrition was just really starting out. There wasn't a lot out there in terms of sports nutrition. And so I kind of had to do this double major in order to get the sports nutrition. And I told my dad, I said, I'm going to go to school and I'm going to come back to Wisconsin. I grew up in Wisconsin and I'm going to be the dietitian for the Green Bay Packers. And he was like, yeah, whatever. Right. <laughs> but, you know, fast forward, um, I moved to Florida after graduating and then became the dietitian for the Atlanta Magic. So, you know, it's not bad. Um, it's, <laughs> it's it's like... close. And then, of course, working with USTA and WWE and, and everyone else, Run Disney, I've worked with a lot of different um, athletes throughout the years. So, you know, that's just my passion. Um, just like you guys are passionate about tennis, my passion is just athletics in general. Um, I love, I'm a marathon runner um, myself. And so, you know, just always have been fit and active and had it as one of my big priorities in life is to stay healthy and fit. And then also, you know, pair the nutrition with that to help people to perform at their best, no matter what sport they're in. Or I work with a lot of, you know, regular people too, who aren't necessarily, you know, big performing professional athletes, but just want to perform at their best, no matter what they're doing in their life. So yeah, it's just kind of been a passion of mine. Well, first of all, I'd like to just point out that I'm into, you know, trying to stay, you know, staying fit is a complete understatement. <laughs> I know for a fact that you wake up like four in the morning and on half a marathon every day. Like it's not just, it's not just staying fit. I, I think you get more exercise in a day than I've probably gotten the last six months. But, uh... <laughs> right. um, no, that's, that's amazing. Um, so then, so, okay. So you basically, you started with, so then you started with Orlando magic. Cause I know you also, I mean, I, I know you also worked for like human performance Institute and, and, and things like that. So did you go straight? So you kind of like graduated college, you know, did the double major and then went straight to Florida from there. Is that, is no, that right? I, so, you know, the, I always have interns that, that work with me. They're like, I want to be like you. And I want to turn work with professional athletes. I'm like, you have to kind of cut your teeth first on some other things before you can, you know, get into the big league. So I definitely cut my teeth. I worked about five years in a hospital system, but it was all prevention. So I worked with executive health. So I worked with senior executives, fortune 500 companies, helped them to be at the top of their game and then started my own business. And then once I was starting my own business is that that's when I, you know, really kind of got a reputation and the Orlando Magic actually reached out to me um, and said, hey, can you work with a couple of our players? And so I worked with a few other players and then that led to, you know, the kind of title of being the, the team dietitian for them and did that for many years. Also started the program at UCF. They didn't have a nutritionist pre prior to me. Um, and so I was able to start um, working with the athletes at the University of Central Florida and, and get a nutrition program started there. 
Um, you know, like I said, this was, you know, this is groundbreaking back in the, back in the day, you know, schools didn't have registered dietitians, teams didn't have registered dietitians. And now, you know, many high, you know, schools have, you know, three, four, five registered sports dietitians on staff just to work with the athletes. Um, so quite an exciting field that I sort of got, you know, in the, in, on the ground level, really. No, that's because I'm old. <laughs> that, <I'll laughs> stop. No, that's 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 absolute. That's absolutely amazing. And so, okay, so obviously you have, you know, experience. Like you said, you you are interested in athletics in general, right? Um, so you have experience with a lot of different sports. Um, can we just before we kind of start, you know, focusing in on tennis specifically? Can we just talk about athletics more broadly? And what is the importance of a good, you know? a good diet, a focus on nutrition, what happens to athletes, like what's a universal consequence or some of the universal consequences that happen to athletes um, when they don't have a good diet or when they don't, you know, have a focus on nutrition? That's a really good question. And, you know, the athletes I work with a lot of times are very young because think about when you're in your prime is when you're, you know, kind of on the younger side of life and they think they're invincible you know, oh, oh, I can just eat whatever I want and I can, you know, perform at whatever level. And I always tell them that there's three things that go into your athletic performance. And that is your genetics. Thank your mom and dad. That is your training. Thank your coaches. And that is what you're putting into your body. And you can't perform at your best if you're putting junk in the tank, but not even just performing, it's recovering. I mean, you guys know that, you know, when you have practices day after day after day, maybe, maybe have one rest day a week, and then also sometimes have two day practices between, you know, fitness and, and tra training and strength and conditioning and on court. And, you know, so it's not just what I'm doing in my sport, but it's all of the training around that that goes into that. And fueling that and recovering from that is going to be really important. So you say, you know, what are some of the consequences? Well, injury is a big one. I talk a lot about injury prevention with my athletes and how you can eat in order to prevent some of that injury and sleep. You know, even though I'm the nutrition girl, um, I, you know, definitely hit some of the other topics around health as well. And sleep is one of those. We could do a whole nother podcast just on sleep <laughs> um, and, and the importance of sleep. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really, you know, if you want to keep going and if you want a long career, then what you're putting in your body when you're putting it into your body. So it's not just the what, but also the when, which we'll get into, but that's really, you know, where nutrition becomes really important is with the longevity of your career, the performance in the moment and the recovery. Right. And so in terms of, so, okay. So obviously like all athletes have to recover all athletes, you know, uh, it has to be high quality. I'm assuming, you know, like you're saying, you're fueling your body. So it must be of the best standard if you want to perform uh, at the best level. What are some of the, you know, because like, for example, you're working with, you know, let's say you work with Orlando Magic and now you're working with the USTA. What are some of the differences that you find or that you have seen like are, are noteworthy or are important in, when it comes to different athletes? Like, is it mainly, let's say quality or a quantity of food that you're taking in? Is it um, the type of food that you're taking? I mean, I'm sure there's many different factors, but what are like some of the main things that have stood out to you throughout, you know, throughout your years uh, in the field um, that you've kind of seen, okay, this is, these are the major differences between specific sports. Um, that makes sense. So with all athletes, it's timing. You know, it's making sure that you're fueling first thing in the morning, making sure that you're fueling before, during, and after exercise, um, making sure that you're, you know, so, so timing that way, making sure that you're eating the right things, like you said, but it doesn't need to be perfect. I mean, when you're burning a lot of calories, you need to be taking in quite a few calories, especially with my male athletes. Um, you know, you, you guys are burning a lot more even than the females. Um, and so, you know, there is 
there's some room for some of the fun stuff. I like to call it, you know, mm -hmm. some of the, the French fries and, you know, some cookies and hamburgers and pizza and stuff like that. Yeah, we can include that. And a lot of that actually has a lot of nutritional value. You know, burgers and pizza actually do have a lot of nutritional value. It's not just junk food. So it's finding that balance between, yes, I want to eat really healthfully, but also, you know, I need to actually get the amount of calories in that I need to. Um, you know, between athletes and sports, you know, I work with everyone from golfers to, you know, these WWE athletes to Ironman triathletes, you know, I mean, these guys are, are exercising five, six days, five, six hours a day sometimes with their long runs and long bike rides and swims and, and things like that. So it is very, very different depending on the sport that I'm working on with someone and, and their genetic makeup, you know, man versus woman versus um, you know, size. I mean, I've had, I worked with, um, back when he was at UCF Taco Fall, seven, six, wow. <laughs> seven, six, um, and a college student. So you guys know what it's like to try to, you know, eat on a budget as a college student, try being seven, six. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, eating as many meals as you possibly can. Um, so, you know, you, you're, you, there's definitely a wide variety um, and, and then we talk about hydration, you know, hydration is huge, especially with tennis athletes. And we'll get into that, but, um, you know, the, the amount of sweat that can come out of some of these athletes, again, especially the males, because you guys are sweating more, you're bigger, you're, you're cooling down more, you're sweating more. And so it's looking at, you know, how much quantity is sweating, but also the composition of your sweat and what needs to go in, in terms of electrolytes. So yeah, I mean, strength athlete versus endurance athlete versus like tennis, which is a little of both. You know, you've got the quick reactive, but you also are out there a long time. So you hit being an endurance athlete, but you also hit kind of that, you know, that quick reaction time, which it takes to be a strength athlete. Yeah, definitely. So, so you mentioned, you know, working with, uh, with UCF. I mean, in my experience, I, I feel like maybe at some of these top level schools, you'll have like teams that are working with uh, nutritionists or dietitians that are, that are working for the school. But at some of these lower level schools, you really don't see it. And I'm, I'm curious to get your opinion on it when it comes to college athletes as a whole. And, you know, from my experience, I've seen that I feel like diet and nutrition is very much overlooked, right? They're putting in all this work and effort on the court or in the field or in the gym for their, for their respective sport. But I feel like sometimes like they don't put in the necessary work when it comes to off the field. Right. So kind of talk about your experience in kind of working with UCF and, and working with some of these, you know, these college athletes that maybe didn't have the experience of, of having a nutritionist or a dietitian uh, on their team and sort of what were some of the benefits that came about? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I talked about young people feeling like they're invincible. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, just feeling like, oh, I can eat whatever I want. I can go on party. I can, you know, and, and especially for a student athlete, I feel like student athletes, I think it's one of the most difficult times in your life, even before becoming professional athlete, because when you're a professional athlete, this is your full-time job. Like my WWE athletes, the NBA athletes, like this is their full-time job. And part of your full-time job is to eat right. Because again, that goes into your performance. It goes into your recovery. When you're a student athlete, you've got two full-time jobs. You are a full-time student and you are a full-time athlete. Your coach thinks that's your full-time job <laughs> and your professors think that's your full-time job. And you have to balance between the two. And then you're up late studying. And, you know, I don't have to tell you guys, um, you know, that the balance of a student athlete. So, you know, as someone who's worked with juniors versus collegiate versus professional, I have to say that that collegiate level, um, I think just from a life balance perspective and from a nutrition perspective is one of the most difficult because your time is like completely yeah. pulled and part of nutrition is time. You know, I always say that there's two P words that come with nutrition and it's preparation and planning. And no one likes these P words. No one likes to plan ahead. What am I going to eat? Or especially a college student or to prepare something. What? I have to like think ahead and then actually like put it in a baggie and like bring it with me and throw it into my gym bag. And what? I have to like bring stuff with me. Um, so especially those college programs, like you were saying, that don't have 
the nutrition you know staff there they don't have the locker room stocked with goodies of food and um and you know bars and smoothie stations and you know all the stuff that maybe some of these bigger colleges do have it is going to be up to you and you do have to take the onus and you do have to say you know what this is part of my job if i were to write a job description for myself as an athlete part of my job description is to eat <laughs> and i know that's part of life too but like well, part of your though, job right? description as an athlete is to think about like okay i can't just like roll out of bed and head to practice like I need to get up 30 minutes earlier and eat a bagel, mm -hmm. eat some cereal, eat, you know, make a smoothie, like whatever, so that I'm getting to practice prepared. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, thinking about, okay, I got to run to class right when practice ends. I barely have time to shower and boom, I'm running across campus. What are you going to pack? What are you going to bring? Because you cannot go to class for two hours from a practice with nothing to eat. You can, you're not going to die but that's not gonna be the best recovery for you when you have practice again later today or again tomorrow. So I would say, you know, Steve, the, the answer to your, my long answer to your question is preparation and planning is one of the biggest things you have to do. If you don't have someone helping you, professionally helping you, or, you know, your team doesn't have all of those snacks and meals and stuff provided for you, then you gotta take it on yourself and realize that this is part of my job no, no totally I, absolutely i was i mean i was just gonna say like I, i'm i'm definitely speaking from experience over here because <laughs> i definitely didn't have the best uh off court preparation and planning um it's one black one black coffee a day that's, yeah that's so about it <laughs> I, I was i was one of those i was one of those people where like i literally couldn't eat before a match or, or a practice, I just, cause I would feel so lethargic. So like, they would always make fun of me because like we would go on like team breakfasts before a match. But the problem is, is like, if we're traveling like five hours away or whatever, uh, we're, we're basically going in, grabbing breakfast, like 20 minutes before the warm up, And I'm like, you guys can do that. I can't do that. So meanwhile, Alex is putting down like, like the breakfast of champions, like without a problem, <laughs> even though he's got a match in 20 minutes, but that's besides the point. So I, I mean, I, I literally ran on like black coffee before my matches. And then just like, I would eat whatever, like after, like, it was so like, like off the, off the hip and not really like planned. And I definitely think that that is a place where if I sort of, you know, paid more attention to, I could have definitely benefited me more. For sure. Well, I'm so glad that you said that. And let me just jump in here because I think that's one of the biggest, I know this is something you were going to ask me later, but I'm going to answer it now. What is one of the, one of the things that you can do to become a pro? to become you know, more successful. And that is practicing what you're gonna do on competition day in practice. So mm -hmm. what you should have done looking back is say, okay, instead of telling yourself this story, I can't eat anything before matches, otherwise I'm gonna get sick. Like maybe that's true, but it is a story that you told yourself that you started to believe over time, right? Yeah. What you do is you go back and you go, okay, you know what? I'm going to practice this and practice days and I'm going to eat a half a granola bar. I'm going to eat a half a banana, like start with something really small, 20 minutes before my practice and see how that sits. And I'm going to do that day after day after day until my body says, oh, okay. Yeah. You're going to give me that. You're going to give me the little piece of granola bar. You're going to give me that little piece of banana. I'm used to that now. So you can train your body to change the story. <laughs> you really can. I've seen it with lots of athletes. I've done it with lots of athletes that you change that story of, I can't eat before a competition. I can't eat before a practice. That's one of the things that, you know, I saw when I entered the tennis world versus other worlds, I saw all these athletes doing something completely differently in matches than they were in practice. Oh, well in practice, I drink this and I eat this, but in matches, I drink this and I do this. And I'm like, why is this so different? We need to practice what we're doing in practice for competition, right? 
So, you know, the same drink, the same bar, the same choose, the same, like whatever it is, banana, like if that's what you're going to do in changeovers in a match, then that's what you should do in practice so that your body becomes accustomed to doing this. So, yeah. I'm going to, I see, this is what I do as I dispel all of your excuses. Absolutely. That's right. That's, see, what, that's this, what we were hoping this for, is, honestly. You know, you know, of course, Alex introduces you to me like after, you know, we're all retired. This is, and, uh, this is my plan all along, yeah. right? It's just to be <laughs> yeah. like, I told you so. That's because he didn't want to get you to, he didn't want you to get yeah, too that's, good. That's it. It's all, it's all in here. It's I all think, in I here. Th I think you're onto something. <laughs> um, um, so I, I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to ask you, actually, I have two questions. One about the UCF, uh, you know, your experience at UCF, and then the second about your, you kind of transitioning into the, you know, your experience at USTA. I'm going to ask you the US, UCF one first. So we talked about like this variation, right? Or the variability in a college athlete's life. Steven was saying, you know, sometimes we'd be driving five hours before a match. Sometimes it'd be two hours. Sometimes, you know, you, you just don't know when you're going to eat. Uh, class time, you know, uh, when you have practice, there's just so many variables at play, parties, whatever, whatever you got going on. Um, what are some of the things, like obviously going into this, going into your UCF experience, you knew that this was going to be something that you're going to be dealing with, right? You, you kind of, I'm sure you anticipated that, that lifestyle that a college athlete has. What are some of the things that you implemented in terms of like on a, not just on an individual basis, but across the athletic department to motivate players to kind of become more consistent. Um, whereas the, you know, if, if let's say, for example, if you're talking to um, uh, an athletic director at a school right now, what would you tell them to be like, do these things in order to get your athletes in sync? Uh, increase your budget. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Allocate more money for yeah, nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Allocate more money for, I'm speaking to you <laughs> athletic directors right now. Allocate more money for registered dietitian, nutritionist, sports dietitians on your staff first. Um, but besides that, um, allocate more money to actually providing food to your athletes. So a lot of schools maybe put them on the meal plan. You know, they have like the, you know, the meal plan where they can go and get the food and whatever. But also, you know, when you're like, you guys know, when you're traveling, like who's bringing what, you know, if the team can provide because college students, even though I just said it, you need to plan, prepare, this is part of your job they still aren't great at it. And so the more the coaches and the trainers can have, you know, the cooler full of PBJs and string cheese and yogurts and fruit and granola bars and smoothies and da, 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 you know, muscle milks, whatever, you know, whatever it is that you guys have, but I can't tell you how many times I run into hitting my head against the wall because we don't have the budget for that. Yeah. We can't afford that. Really? You can't afford to feed your athletes, you know, and, and supplements too, you know, just some basic supplements, vitamin D, omega-3, multivitamins, you know, that kind of stuff that you can provide to your athletes and literally hand them to them and say, here's your vitamin of the day and, and take this, you know, those kinds of things can, can make a big difference. Um, so, yeah, so I would say, you know, unfortunately it does come down to budget, some budgets sometimes when we're talking about providing food to, to the athletes and the right kinds of food um, to the athletes. And a lot of these, I mean, you guys know, a lot of these sports nutrition products are expensive, right. but you don't have to always do the expensive stuff. We can just eat, you know, bagels with peanut butter and <laughs> cereal and milk and yogurt and smoothies. And, you know, it doesn't have to be totally expensive, crazy, you know, stuff. Um, it can just be real food, but even that can be hard sometimes to get into the budget. I think it's also interesting, like a lot of these schools that say that they don't have it in the budget are the same schools that are like, they'll redo their facilities like every three years. And yeah. in my head, it's like, it's like, you're going to repaint your car, but you don't have any money to put the gas in the car. Right. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's so backwards. Well, it's also funny because it's, they spend all this money on facilities in order to make more money, right? Yeah. It's like they, they increase the capacity of the stadiums. They do this, they do all that. And yet, yeah, so you're, you're totally right. Um, and then, so in terms of, so, okay. So in terms of your experience at the USTA, then, you know, kind of transitioning into that, 
you obviously you went from working with Orlando Magic to the USTA, vastly different sports, at least in my I, like maybe maybe not, but you know you're you're looking at two different sports, um, and like you said, one of the things you one of the things you saw happen with tennis players is that they were di- they had different practices during you know or nutritional practices when it came to like when they practice like or within training and then when they were playing matches. So what are some of the you know, what are some of the major changes that you made when you came, when you started working with the USTA? What are some of the things where you're like, okay, these are major red flags. We need to fix these things. Um, and what, what were the, what would that, what have been the results of that? Like what, what have you seen over the last, you know, I think you said you've been working there for 12 years at the USTA or how many years? Uh, USTA, I've been there since 2017. They just built the national campus here in Orlando okay. in 2017. Okay. And I started working with them there. So yes, so I work with the the junior players that come and train at the at the national campus, and then I also work with the you know the American pros that are training um, that come in and out of the, you know I mean they're tra- on the road so much, but they'll come back and train for for training blocks um, here and there, and I'll I'll work with those athletes, and then of course I work with them on the road as well, just via you know FaceTime, WhatsApp, and and text. Um, <clears throat> so some of the major changes I would say is is definitely like I already mentioned like encouraging the athlete to practice what they're going to do in competition during practice. Um, Another thing, and and back to that, the main thing was in the hydration. You know, Mm -hmm. they're like, oh, well, I mostly drink water, you know, during practices, but in competition, I'll do, you know, all this other electrolyte and sugar and different stuff. And I'm like, well, why aren't you doing that? You know, why aren't you drinking a sports drink during practice? You're out here for two hours. You know, you need sports drink during practice too. So especially in Florida, Woo, oh my it, is God, right. it is brutal here in the summer. We have a lot of issues with, um, with you know, just heat exhaustion and, and different things, heat related illness um, during the summer, not just from our professional players, but of course the other side of the campus is all of these recreational athletes coming for tournaments and, um, and they just don't, realize um the heat in florida anyway so one of the other some of the other things i did i have a sweat machine i have a a machine that tests your sweat composition and i purchased that machine a few years ago in my business and used it with the magic used it with lots of other um, professional teams and athletes and again those those triathletes especially marathon runners you know when you're losing a huge amount of sweat it's not just the amount of sweat that you're losing, but it's the composition of the sweat. What is in the sweat? And everybody has a different composition of sweat. Some people sweat a lot of salt. Some people sweat a very little amount of salt. So the number one thing that we lose in our sweat is fluid. Number two is salt. Okay. Yeah. You hear about potassium and magnesium and all that kind of stuff too. And yes, those are electrolytes that are lost in sweat, but not nearly as much as salt. So that is one of the things that I have done with a lot of the athletes at USTA is had them realize that you are losing a lot of salt and we need to replenish that salt. And guess what? Gatorade Powerade doesn't do it. It's not enough for the amount that you guys are losing. And so whether we add Gator Lights, whether we use something like, you know, salt stick, I use a product called Precision Hydration. That is, I think you've used that, Alex. Um, That's the the company that um, owns the sweat machine that I use. um, It has this product and it has like maybe two thirds of the amount of um, sugar and like four times the amount of salt that's in like a a normal sports drink. So for these athletes that are more of the endurance athletes or athletes who are out on the court, again, for two, three, four hours at a time, you can't keep up with that amount of salt that you're losing. So yeah, we need, we need fluid on the court. We need sugar. We need carbs. We need some energy on the court, but we also need those electrolytes and Um, And we're losing so much that we can't keep up with it just with a regular sports drink. You know, the sports drinks are great for sugar and some electrolytes, but um, for these professional athletes and for the athletes that are sweating a lot, then we need, you know, we need to kind of take it to another level. So that's another thing that I've done um, with the athletes at USTA is made them really, really hyper aware of salt 
and right. the sodium and the the sweating. You know, it's what's interesting is, is so we actually our conference tournament was always held at the United States, the the the, the national, national campus. campus in uh, in Orlando. So, and I remember like the first year that the the conference tournament was held there was my freshman year. And the difference in the preparation when it came to just our, our hydration from my freshman year to our senior year was drastic because our freshman year, we got down there um, and, you know, we were barely drinking any water. Like we were all dead from the heat within like 20 minutes <laughs> and we were just unable to compete. And it's like it's like we didn't take the proper steps of hydrating like like a few days before. So when you're down there, you're already hydrated. And, uh, and it was just very like, it, it was something that we didn't really think about. And as soon as we started focusing more on hydration and making sure we had enough snacks, enough, like you mentioned, carbs, salts, um, uh, sports drinks, then our, our, our performance, I would say drastically, uh, drastically increased. Well, I also, what's funny is like, I feel like for college tennis specifically, um, y- hydration is even more important because it, like when you're playing a, like a, a tennis match, right, as a junior, or as a pro, or when it's like a, on an individual basis, you, I feel like tennis is quite a relax. Like it's very intense when you're playing, but when you're, you know, on changeovers or when you're between points, there's not that much energy that's, you know, you're not expending that much energy. Mm-hmm. Whereas in college, you have your teammates, you know, uh, screaming at you the whole time and you're screaming back at them. I remember my freshman year, you know, even though I hydrated, like, which a few days before isn't enough, obviously. Uh, but even though I was like, oh, I'm hydrating and I'm doing all this stuff. I was so hyped up and so riled up. Yeah. Screaming in between points that the third set, when I hit that third set in the, in the conference the, against St. Louis, yeah. literally crashed. Yeah. Like, crashed beyond belief. Um, you know, cramps, like, just, like, was just exhausted. Um, so it's, it's really interesting that you, that you mentioned that you, you really need to go beyond just, like, sports drinks and water. And it's, like, it has to be. Because you're talking about those tablets, right? Yeah. They're the little pills, that the, the precision nutrition? Yeah, well, precision hydration has pills, oh, hydration. just salt tabs, but they also have the packets that right. are, like, you add the packet to the water that has the sugar and the, and the salt, whereas the tablet is just the salt. Right. Is there? Yeah, but is, all is the, the above is necessary. <laughs> right. Right. Is the, I'm just I'm just curious. Is there, like, what? Obviously, like, if you don't have enough salt, right, or if you're not hydrating properly, you tend to cramp. Uh, I'm assuming that's like the the result of that. What happens? Like, are there people who like? What happens if you overdo? Like, if you overtake like on sugar or over over you know take it or intake of or like you overdo the intake of salt? Like, what's the what are the consequences? Like, where do you find that balance? Good, good question. And it is a hard balance, and that's why we practice it during practice. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but yes, if you overdo sugar, and some of us have experienced that, you know, even as a marathon runner, um, I can experience that. And this is actually something very common with marathon runners and triathletes is stomach cramps and stomach cramps lead to where is a porta potty, if you know what I'm saying. So um, immediate need for elimination (laughs) so that, you know, diarrhea and and all that fun stuff, we call it the runner's trots, Um, whatever you want to call it. Um, But yeah, I used to know where every single porta potty was on my, on my route. (laughs) Never know when it's going to hit. Um, and, and that sugar, you know, that concentrated sugar especially can cause that because your blood flow is everywhere but your stomach. And so that's why, you know, that's why sports drinks are a six to eight percent um, sugar solution versus like apple juice <laughs> or, you know, some people like uh, actually ultra distance runners like flattened, you know, Coke, um, they'll do, you know, flattened soda um, sometimes because it's more concentrated sugar and they're, they're running because they're ultra, they're running at a lower intensity than, you know, even a marathon or a half marathon or something is a higher speed. But anyway, so, so yeah, that's why, um, that's why we need, you know, these sometimes sports specific things because they do, I mean, there is millions of dollars that have gone into the research around these sports drinks and the right amount that's not going to cause those stomach cramps and not going to cause. So, you know, you asked what can happen if you get too much sugar. So stomach cramps is going to be the biggest one, Um, you know, and that's why even like gels and the chews, like I, you know, especially as a woman, like that's a lot of sugar all at once for me, 
to try to do in a run. So I'll do like a half a gel, I'll fold it back up, stick it back in my shorts and, um, and then eat the other half, you know, maybe 20 minutes later. So same thing that you can do, you know, on the court in tennis is, you know, maybe eat one or two chews and then fold up the package, come back and have it again, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, have another chew. So that's the nice thing about tennis is that you do have like that break every once in a while set for you to have you know the sugar and the salt and the fluid on a regular basis you don't have to just cram it all at one time you kind of have that nice break every 15 20 minutes or so to be able to do that um salt unlike sugar doesn't really cause the cramping doesn't really you know do any of that so you know i'm not big on like oh you know unscrew the salt shaker and salt everything you know a ton because you're an athlete but that being said, I do encourage my athletes to have a higher level of sodium intake at all times than the average American, okay, than the average person, because you are losing, because you're exercising every day, many times a day sometimes. So you are losing that. But during exercise is when we want the sugar, the salt, you know, the fluid. And you mentioned even a couple of days, you know, prior. So I'll have athletes do... Um, one of these, you know, higher salt packets, maybe the night before, not practices, but maybe competition, just trying to get a little bit of a load on. So what salt does, we have intracellular water and we have extracellular water. Okay. So your intracellular water is basically like your blood. Okay. Hopefully you're not going to lose that during a match, <laughs> but your extracellular water, yeah, that was a really intense match if you do. My WWE guys we will lose some of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but the, but your extracellular water um, is going to be, you know, your, your fluid that you're losing in sweat. And so what salt does is it actually helps you to retain some of that extracellular water so that when you're ready to you know hit your first serve baseline uh, at the beginning of that match you are as hydrated as you possibly can at the start of that match so night before morning of making sure that you're having some like sports drink not just water 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 but having some sports drink, maybe a higher sodium sports drink, like we're talking about, that's going to have you, you know, retain just a little bit. And, you know, when I work with marathon runners, um, you know, I expect you to gain two or three pounds the week prior to the marathon. That's not fat. It's not fat. It's water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you guys know water holds a lot. Like when you weigh yourself before and after a practice or a match, like you could lose, depending on your body size, you could lose two, three, four, five pounds. Some of my Orlando Magic players would lose eight pounds in a practice. Okay. If I lost eight wow. pounds at 120 pounds, I'd be in the hospital. But when you're, you know, 240 pounds of solid muscle and you, you lose eight pounds, you know, we, but we need to replenish that, you know, so it's a percentage of your body weight that you're losing. But that's what I say, when I am working with big, heavy male athletes, the amount of fluid compared to a female athlete is ridiculous, ridiculous. Wow. I mean, it's, it's, you can't keep up with it um, a lot of times. And that's why we need to preload for days prior to like a marathon. So back to the, why does a marathon or gain a couple of pounds? Because one, they're, they're tapering. And so they're, they're, you know, obviously burning fewer calories, but they're also replenishing your glycogen stores. So your glycogen stores are your carbohydrate stores. Carbohydrates hang on to water in your body. So this is why when people do like the Atkins diet and they're like, oh, I lost seven pounds in a week. Well, you didn't lose seven pounds of fat. You lost a lot of fluid because you depleted your carbohydrate stores. So that's mm -hmm. another thing that we try to load before a match or before a marathon or before any kind of a competition is, you know, that, that carbs the night before. So carbs and salt night before carbs, salt, salt, fluid the night before morning of that way. Again, when you're on that baseline, ready to start, 
now I've got my glycogen full, I've got my fluid full, I've got my salt full, like you are ready to now lose it all <laughs> as you're as you're in that competition. Does that make sense? No, totally. And so does that apply? I mean, because it sounds like based on, you know, the way you're describing it, it sounds like that applies to all athletes. Because I was going to ask, like, what is the ideal diet for a tennis player, considering the fact that they're both endurance and, you know, that quick, quick pace kind of, uh, re I don't know, how did you describe it exactly? Endurance and then the... And the uh, kind of the start stop. Yeah, just, right. just exactly. That, that more, yeah. Just a quick pace. So, you know, but it sounds like, is that, is that just like a universal thing that all athletes should do? Or is there an ideal diet for a tennis player? Like if you were to say, like, like I'm, a, let's say I am, um, you know, I'm one of the juniors at the USTA uh, national campus and I want, you know, I, I come to you and I say, listen, what's my ideal diet? Like in order to perform the best before, so what do I eat before a match in order to perform, perform the best, at, you know, during the match? And then what's the best diet for me after the match so that I recover best? Is that like, is that kind of the same across all sports or is there something specific to tennis that maybe differs a little bit? Yeah, I mean, every sport's going to be a tiny bit different again, because if I have a swimmer who's swimming for 30 seconds, <laughs> in a 50 meter race, you know, I mean, they might have multiple events and then, but they have time in between those events, you know, that's going to be different or a golfer who's very low intensity, but might be on the course for six hours or, you know, definitely four hours or something like that. You know, they're going to be able to eat a sandwich on the court, you know, you're on the course, you're not going to necessarily, you know, again, this is why tennis is such a difficult sport because you are out there, you know, in, in the junior level and even the collegiate level, not quite as long, but, you know, you watch some of these matches in the pros and some of these male matches and woo, I mean, these things can go on for three, four hours. Right. Um, so, so when you're, when you're thinking about, you know, what do you, what do you eat on a daily basis? Let's start there. And then we'll, we'll talk about like kind of pre and, and post-match. So I always tell my athletes, there's three things that you want at every single meal, every single meal. Okay. So just think your day-to-day -day nutrition, some kind of carbs, some kind of protein, some kind of fruit and or vegetable. Mm -hmm. So think breakfast, carb, bread, bagels, English muffin, waffles, cereal, oatmeal, potatoes. I don't care. Just get a carb, <laughs> mm -hmm. some kind of protein, you know, eggs, Greek yogurt, protein in my protein shake, you know, some, uh, Canadian bacon, regular bacon, eh, more fat than protein, but, you know, thinking about milk, you know, dairy, great source of protein, and then some kind of fruit or vegetable. So have that banana, have that orange juice, have that whatever. Okay. So, and then think about that for lunch and dinner as well. So rice, pasta, tortillas, you know, potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, peas, corn, you know, even starchy vegetables are going to be your carb. Obviously any of your, you know, animal proteins, if you're a vegetarian, there's lots of ways to get um, protein, even as a vegetarian with the different, you know, veggie burgers and beans and, um, and tofu and, and things like that. Um, and then, you know, the fruits and vegetables, and here's the deal with the fruits and vegetables is I don't just say it because I'm like nutrition girl. I say it because as an athlete, okay, think about how hard your practices are. Do you work hard in your practice? This is what I always ask my athletes. Okay. Do you work hard in your practice? And they're like, yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> is my coach listening? Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Well, guess what? Exercise is good for us, right? We know that, you know, Surgeon General, CDC, all these people tell us all these recommendations for how exercise is good for us. Well, when you take it to the level that even these junior levels are, are doing, let alone collegiate, let alone pro, okay? It is hard on your body. Yeah, there's health benefits to exercise, but you exercise at such a high level that it almost is damaging is right. mm -hmm. dangerous. And I don't say that to be like, you know, oh, you shouldn't do this. Heck no, I do it too. Like you said, I'm a very right. intense exerciser. It's mm -hmm. not healthy to run 26 miles. Like I will be the first to admit that, right. but I Same love man. it. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard and it damages my body and I'm sore for weeks after, right? So, so my point is, is that we choose this. We choose to exercise at a level that is potentially damaging. Well, when that high intensity exercise happens, it's stress, 
Okay. What happens when we have stress in our body, whether it's environmental stress and I'm smoking and I'm bringing in all this crap into my lungs, you're, it creates free radicals. Or if it's just emotional stress or if it's physical stress of exercise, it creates free radicals. And those free radicals attack your cells. They attack your cells. And when they attack your cells, that leads to injury, that leads to disease, that leads to damage, that leads to immune system, that leads to all kinds of nasty stuff. So as athletes, we're at higher risk of obviously injury because we're working our muscles so hard, but we're also, our immune system can take a hit because we're pushing, 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 pushing all the time. So those free radicals, guess what? Guess what denatures free radicals? Your fruits and vegetables, okay? So it's the antioxidants, the phytonutrients, all these things that you always hear about, these buzzwords, the beta carotene, the resveratrol, the lutein, the lycopene, the da, 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 zeaxanthin. Like I could impress you with all kinds of different names of phytochemicals that I know off the top of my head, but it doesn't matter. Just eat them, okay? So I don't care how you get them. If you drink orange juice, if you put them in a smoothie, if you, you know, if you eat raw broccoli, if you eat cooked broccoli, I don't care. Just get your fruits and vegetables in there. Any way that you get them, they're going to help to protect from that damage. So that's the reason why I push the fruits and vegetables so not so much. It's not just mom saying, eat your fruits and vegetables, but like, again, this is your job as an athlete to protect your body from the damage that you're doing. Yes, it's healthy, but it's unhealthy. The amount and the level and the intensity that some of our workouts go, that's just a fact. And so how can I protect myself from that? That's what those fruits and vegetables are for. Okay. So I went way off topic with your, your question. About what to, do I eat before, no, that's, during, that's, after? That's the, that's the, that's the beauty of, of, uh, of, of all this is like, yeah, we, we just go on like tangents. We, and it's, it's we amazing. want you to, we want you <laughs> exactly. to go. just like run with it. <laughs> so that's your, so that's your normal nutrition. Okay. So just think like every meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner, where's my fruit or vegetable. And I don't care if it's fruit or vegetable. If you hate vegetables, eat more fruit. If you, you know, don't like fruit for some reason, then eat your vegetables. I don't care. Just eat your fruits and vegetables, have your carbs, have your protein and don't fall into this low carb crap. You know, as an athlete, again, this is some of the difference between normal nutrition and athlete nutrition. I need more salt as an athlete because I sweat more. I need more carbs as an athlete because I'm burning those carbs. So don't listen to this, you know, keto and paleo and all this other stuff that might be out there that might be good for obese America who's sitting on a couch. It's not good for you as an athlete, you need carbohydrates, you need carbohydrates all day long. All right, so so now let's talk pre so pre whether it's pre practice or pre competition is not gonna be that much different but we just focus a little bit more on competition day and make sure that it gets in there, so what you want is carbs carbs are your body's preferred source of energy. So, you know, a breakfast of eggs and bacon before a match, not so good. We need, you know, bagel, toast, waffle, whatever. We need some oatmeal, cereal. We need some carbs in there and a little bit of protein. Protein helps to give you a little bit more lasting energy. So, you know, just like you were saying, Stephen, if I don't want to eat real close to competition, as long as I can eat a little bit further from competition and let it just, but you also don't want to be hungry then mm -hmm. by the time competition comes. But if I can have that eggs and bacon and toast and like big old breakfast, yeah, you're not gonna go you know, and compete 20 minutes after that. But if you can get that in, that's replenishing from overnight and then give it an hour or two to digest or maybe three hours, four hours, however long you have. And then maybe you just top it off with that banana, with that granola bar, with that sports drink, with that gel, with that something right before competition that's going to sit a little bit better in the stomach. So it just depends on how much time you have, what your comfort level is with how big of a meal you want to have, how close to competition. Um, but definitely, you know, if it's going to be further apart, then have top it off with something smaller right before you go out. Um, and then during, you know, we already talked about sports drinks sports, and this is where we do spend the money on those expensive sports products because they've been <laughs> they've been tested to be good for us whether it's the gels the you know the chews or the sports drinks in general you can use of course fruit um you know again in the game of tennis if 
if you're out there for longer, you know, and you have a 90 minutes or 90 second, I know 90 seconds is really fast, but what can I, you know, get down in 90 seconds? Can I eat a half a banana or just a bite of banana and drink some sports drink and boom, I'm back out. Um, you know, dried fruit is another one that I do recommend, but we also, if you're going to do dried fruit, that's a lot of potassium, but we need salt. So mm. make sure that you're getting some salt in there as well, whether it's a salt tab, like literally I swallow the salt in a tablet mm. or whether it's, you know, salt, more salt, that's going to be added to your sports drink than what the sports drink alone just recommends or re has in it. Um, all right. And then post-exercise, you know, and this is where, again, we practice, and this is where post is even more important in practice, even than it is in competition. Well, I, I shouldn't say that they're both important, but again, practice you're doing day after day after day after day. So I have to eat something. I want fluid and carbs within 30 minutes after practice. 30 minutes. That could be more sports drink, or it could be a banana and some water. And then, or it could be carbs, protein, and fluid like chocolate milk. You know, chocolate milk is one of the biggest recovery beverages out there because it tastes good. And it's great for juniors because juniors are used to drinking milk still. Um, you know, we grew up drinking milk and then we kind of quit doing it as an adult. Um, but, you know, chocolate milk um, or a smoothie with some protein powder in it, you know, so you can get protein within that 30 minutes as well. But I'm always saying protein within two hours, like fine. Just as long as you get protein within two hours after, that's great. But carbs and fluid immediately, like within mm. 30 minutes. And if some protein slips in there too, great. But don't have only protein. Like I'll have athletes that do the water with the protein powder. Mm. And that protein powder has like four grams of carbs and 20 grams of protein. And they do the shaker cup and drink it down. I got my protein after exercise. I need carbs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your, your glycogen, your carbohydrate stores are what you just used. Your body's not ready to build and repair yet. That's going to happen later. It needs to replenish first. So carbs first, protein second, or have them at the same time. Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned that because there is this like, I feel like the common knowledge is that protein rebuilds and then, but if you don't, that's so interesting that if you don't have, if you don't replenish, then you can't rebuild. So that's, that's, I didn't actually know that. It'll take the protein and use that for energy because it needs energy. Right. So then you don't right. have protein left to build. Right. <laughs> You're like, what? Yeah. Right. So we need carbs and protein for sure. Here's a, here's a question. So, I mean, in the tennis world, I would say it was around when Novak Djokovic switched to being gluten-free, um, which was something that like, I, I don't know if he, he might, might, might have not been the first one to do it, um, but he was definitely like the one who got the most media coverage around it and started like really paying attention to his diet because we had a guy who was, you know, a very talented top in the world player, but you saw him in the Australian Open gas out how many times, have a suffer with injuries, just like overall physically not able to compete at that high level. And it was, it wasn't until he started working with a, with a, with a dietitian and nutritionist where he was able to like, he was like, okay, well I'm allergic and I have this and my body performs better on this. And he, he basically went really in depth with it. And then you saw a bunch of other players starting to do it. And recently a trend that I've started to notice from talking to athletes is a lot of them are going towards plant-based. Um, and that's kind of the question I wanted to have you when it comes to your athletes. Like, have you also been recommending, you know, athletes to go on plant-based? Like, what are some of the benefits that come from it? And is it, you know, is it good for everybody to do? Like, how, how does that work? Yeah. All right. So let me address the gluten-free thing first, and then mm -hmm. I'll get to plant-based. So here's the deal with gluten-free. Gluten is a protein that is in wheat, barley, and rye. Okay. Not everybody has a problem with it. In fact, about 99% of the population doesn't have a problem with it. Okay. So there's a very, very small percentage of people who have celiac disease or have gluten intolerance where they literally like get bloating, gas, fatigue, you know, some kind of issues with that gluten. So there's absolutely no benefit absolutely no benefit to cutting out gluten unless you have an issue with it. And to really know whether you have an issue with it is to go to a doctor and get a test done. 
-hmm. And, you know, they can do blood tests, they can do biopsies. That's where they really, that's the gold standard is literally do a biopsy of your intestines and see if you have this, you know, have celiac disease. Um, but there's varying levels of kind of a gluten intolerance as well. So that being said, you can't half ass it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I hear all the time, people are like, oh, I kind of try to sort of reduce my gluten. I'm like, no, uh-uh. So someone who has gluten intolerance or celiac disease, it, it causes this inflammation in your gut, okay? The only cure, the only treatment for celiac disease is to avoid gluten. There's no pill, there's no medication, there's no anything. You have to stop eating gluten because then that cilia, so that's why it's called celiac disease because cilia is the little hairs that are in your stomach and those become really inflamed, not hairs, but like these, you know, they become really inflamed because of that gluten, okay? In order to have that inflammation go down, you have to stop eating gluten. The minute, the second gluten gets reintroduced, whew, there's havoc again. So you can't, you can't cheat on a gluten-free diet or you will know it, okay? So if you don't really notice a difference, if you go on gluten or off, then you aren't gluten intolerant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or if you cheat all the time, then you're not gluten intolerant. Like people who have gluten intolerance absolutely are so highly motivated to absolutely ask the server, like, no, seriously, I cannot have gluten. Like I cannot, they have a separate toaster in their house for their gluten-free toast than the rest of the family that might have their gluten-containing toast. Because one speck that's on the side of the toaster that gets into theirs can, okay? So I kind of have a soapbox, if you can't tell, on the whole <laughs> thing um, that, you know, I hear it all the time that people are like, oh yeah, but you know, and then I, if I have pizza, then I kind of cheat. No, this isn't a low fat, low carb, whatever diet that you cheat on. You don't cheat on it because it's your health. Okay. But 99% of the people do not need to avoid gluten. So I don't know if, if Dokovic has celiac disease. I don't know if he's been, had a biopsy and is confirmed. I don't know this. Um, but you know, great if he's following a gluten-free diet and has found success with that. Um, but you know, the average Joe does not need to do a gluten-free diet and will not really experience much difference unless they do have, you know, an issue, um, going on genetically in their body that causes them to not, um, do gluten. All right. So now let's talk about plant-based. Um, so plant-based can mean lots of different things. That just means that the majority of my diet comes from plants, which by the way, all of us should be. <laughs> the majority, remember three things that give you, that we should have at each meal, grains and fruits and vegetables are plants. And then we have a little bit of protein there. So, you know, plant-based doesn't mean you have to become vegan and vegan is absolutely no animal products. A vegetarian, regular vegetarian is usually a lacto-ovo, which means lacto is milk. Ovo means eggs. Most vegetarians out there still do dairy and eggs, but they just won't do meat. So there's very, and then you have pesco vegetarians that will eat fish, but won't eat, you know, beef, chicken, pork, whatever. So there's lots of different, you know, levels of vegetarianism and of this idea of plant-based. So yes, absolutely. Since the beginning of my career, have I encouraged people to eat plant-based because I want the majority of your diet to come from plants, but we need protein. And so can you be a vegan athlete? Absolutely. Absolutely. World's strongest man at one time, um, whenever he mm -hmm. held that title as a vegan. Okay. But it's hard. All right. You have to really plan well in order to get the protein that you need as an athlete, especially a strength athlete, um, to build and repair those muscles on a regular basis. But is it possible? Yes. But this is where you, you work with a, a sports dietitian and say, help me figure out how can I get enough protein so that I can, you know, build and repair. Um, and so, so yeah, I think, you know, the definition of plant-based just means I'm going to eat the majority of my food as plant and whether you want to, you know, incorporate some of these plant-based proteins more. So whether you want to incorporate some of the newer found, you know, impossible and beyond meat and all that kind of stuff, or you just want to, you know, have more beans. Yay you know, have a bean burrito and don't put chicken in it, um, have, you know, more, more, you know, lentil soup and, you know, have more bean based foods, um, you know, incorporate some soy foods. Great. 
Um, you know, use a plant-based protein powder if you want, but I'm a huge fan of whey protein powder. I think whey has the best um, in terms of the research around recovery and, mm -hmm. um, and you know, the levels of, um, of amino acids that we need for recovery. So, um, so yeah, I guess that's a long answer to yes, do plant-based, but that doesn't mean you have to commit to being a vegetarian, but maybe try to reduce some of the mm -hmm. amount of animal protein that you're doing and replace it with some plant protein, but you don't have to completely cut it out. What are, uh, what are your thoughts on, because I feel like, especially in the US, we have this like over-exaggerated um, idea of how much protein we need to be taking in. Like, for example, like, I feel like, like as a, you know, being in college and having like, especially with, you know, male athletes, I feel like so many guys are like, I need to have a 24 ounce steak. Otherwise, like I am not getting enough protein in. I need to be taking, oh no, 20 grams of protein and a regular protein shake isn't enough. I need the double dose. You know, I need to do the 40 grams. Otherwise, it's not enough. Can you talk a little bit about like this misconception? I, I, I guess, well, I, I personally don't know, but I'm assuming it is this like misconception on we need more protein and like what's the what is the actual amount of protein that we need i mean maybe it's not applied to maybe it doesn't apply to everyone but what is the actual amount of protein we need in order to you know recover in order to be at our best uh perform like perform best yeah very good question and obviously you know again when i look at the different athletes i've worked with throughout the years um, and now I've been with the WDBE now officially for about a year and a half. I was working with a few athletes here and there before that, but officially since May of 2020. Um, and I can tell you that that population <laughs> is probably the worst offenders when it comes to like, I need a ton of protein. And these guys are big. Okay. If you have not watched the WWE, like seriously, ridiculously good athletes. Some of them are not as big and they are more acrobatic athletes and whatever, but they are athletes um, and they work out hard. I watch them. I watch them train. I watch them ring train. I watch them compete. I watch them do it all. And it is, it is mind boggling to me. And so, yes, protein is going to be very important. Um, for all athletes, whether you are a strength athlete, whether you are an endurance athlete, you know, we need to, and hopefully if you're an endurance athlete, you're doing some strength training. Um, and so, you know, we, we definitely need more protein than again, the average person. So my rule of thumb with athletes is to say, you do not need more than one gram per pound, just because that's an easy one to do in your head, the math, okay? So if I'm 150 pounds, I don't need more than 150 grams of protein. Now that is the absolute max. What I calculate for them is gonna actually be much lower than that. But, you know, I'll have often, I have, I mean, just this week, I had one of my WDBE guys that are like, yep, yeah, I'm trying to get 250 grams of protein a day. I'm like, mm. and he's like 180 pounds. Yeah, no, you don't need that much protein. Any excess protein that your body isn't using for building and repairing muscle is just going to be used as energy or is going to be stored. Thank you very much. What does storage mean? Yeah, yeah, around the belly. Wow. <laughs> okay, if it's too many calories, if it's too much, it, just because it's protein doesn't mean it's gonna you know, go directly to my, my shoulders and biceps. Um, you know, exercise is what builds muscle and the protein helps to, you know, repair that, but you can't just eat more protein and think you're going to get bigger. Obviously exercise is what does that. So, um, so to answer, you know, again, I don't have short answers to anything, but you know, the long answer is no more than one gram per pound. We need much less than that. So what I calculate out is I, I was trained to turn things into kilograms, which in the U S we don't do kilograms. Mm -hmm. um, so I use, um, I use like for my tennis athletes, um, if you're 150 pounds, so I'm going to do it right now. I've got my, my calculator right here. All right. So let's say you're 150 pounds, divide 150 by 2.2. Okay. So you're 68 kilograms. All right. So then I multiply that for my, my tennis athletes. I would do like 1.2 probably to 1.5. So that would give you 81 to 102. So somewhere around 80 to 100 grams of protein for a 150 pound person. Mm. Okay. 
for my WWE athletes, I'm going to go 1.5 to 1.8. So that guy is going to girl, whoever the 150 pound random person is, is going to need more like um, 100 to 122. So I go like 1.5 to 1.8. So more like 100. So a strength athlete, I'm going to go a little bit higher. Um, but I'm not going to go all the way to 150 for 150 pound athlete because you don't need it, but that's the absolute max. Okay. Right. The other thing that you kind of brought up is this 24 ounce steak, right? So, okay, well, you know, I just like to eat my cereal for breakfast and I just like pasta for lunch. And then I get all my protein at dinner. No, all the research now, and there's a lot of research on protein and and how protein is used to build muscle and what we're realizing even and this is just even in the past few years of research is that we have to have this protein spread out i mean we need calories we need carbs we need everything spread out throughout the day but they're finding more and more protein if you can spread that protein out and have smaller amounts spread out more throughout the day that is going to be more beneficial to you in terms of that muscle building and especially at breakfast, you know, think about your typical breakfast foods. They're very high carb because we need energy first thing in the morning, but we also need to make sure that we're having some protein. So I'm a 5 a.m. exerciser, actually earlier, like 4.30. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. God. I like it how you're, I like it how you're trying to taper it down just to like, just, <laughs> just to not. Crazy. <laughs> So my point is I'm exercising first thing in the morning. So I always want people to eat something right before, or, you know, if you're, if you're exercising in the morning, I still want a little snack, a little snack, like Stephen hates to do, but I'll have a couple <laughs> handfuls of dry cereal. Okay. And some water and that's it. Okay. Cinnamon toast crunch. If you want to know my favorite. <laughs> yeah. Sugared cereal. The diet. I just should eat sugar cereal. Exposed. Love it. Oh my God. All right. I know I'm blowing you. I'm blowing your mind right now. So I do a couple handfuls of dry cereal. I drink some water. Boom. I'm exercising because it's 430 in the morning. I'm not going to let it sit and digest. No, that's why I just eat some carbs. Okay. I might have a piece of toast. I might have um, a banana, like something high carb. Then after my workout, I just burned a lot of calories doing my intense workout. Now I need recovery. I'm going to have carbs. Yes. I'm going to have fruit. Yes. And I'm going to have protein. If I just have a bowl of cereal with, with a little bit of milk in it, I am starving an hour later. I need a significant amount of protein. Remember what I said earlier about protein, protein fills you up. Protein gives you lasting energy. Protein gives you satiety. So if I have my, my go-tos, I have three go-to proteins for breakfast. Greek yogurt, I do plain Greek yogurt, and I actually will add some protein powder to my Greek yogurt and mix it up. Or I'll add like PB2 sometimes um, to get a little peanut butter flavor, or I'll just add like a half a scoop of just regular protein powder just to get a little bit more protein even. And then I do a bunch of fruit and then I'll throw, you know, a little bit of granola or some kind of cereal or whatever on top of it. So my base though is like this good amount of, of, of protein. Um, I'll do a smoothie with protein powder in it, or I'll do eggs. Like those are my three go-tos for breakfast that will give me the protein that I need to recover from my workout, but also give me some satiety as I'm going through now, you know, starting my work day. Um, you know, same thing at lunch, same thing at dinner. We got to think like, where is my protein? But breakfast, I emphasize so much because people aren't eating like meat at breakfast mm. typically. So you have to like think outside of the box of like, I need for my women, female athletes, I'll recommend at least 15 to like 25 grams of protein for breakfast for men, like 20 to 30 grams of protein for breakfast. Again, that's more than just milk in your cereal. You gotta like seek it out. And then the rest of the day, usually, like you said, Alex, you know, most people are getting plenty of protein for lunch and dinner, but you don't need a ton, you know, a six ounce chicken breast is plenty. We don't need a crazy, you know, even a four ounce for women, plenty. And then have some protein at snacks, have a, you know, protein based, you know, bar, have a yogurt, have, you know, a protein shake, like have a little bit of protein, have some nuts. Um, you know, have some protein for, for snacks too. And, and again, drizzle the protein throughout the day rather than thinking about it all at one time. So instead of thinking about the number and hitting a certain number, you have to think about consistency and staying consistent throughout the day in order to 
That's super interesting. Yeah. That is because I, I, I feel like I've seen so many diets out there where it's like, well, like intermittent fasting, for example, right? Mm. It's just like you fast in the beginning of the day. You don't, you don't eat anything. And then suddenly you're eating, you know, 10,000 calories. And it's just like, you're all taking it at once. And it's like people, you know, live by that stuff. But it's crazy because it's like that's this is the polar opposite of what you're saying, where you have to break it up throughout the day. That's so that's so interesting. Um, yeah, I'm yeah. not a fan of intermittent fasting, especially for athletes. Like, just you need you need energy right when you get up. You need energy all day long, no matter what time your workout is. You need to keep fueling your body. It's a full time job fueling your body. So you need to start in the morning and keep going as the day goes on. Don't try to do this whole not eating at periods of time throughout the day. Right. You, you would have absolutely hated me in college. I mean, I, I literally ate I once know. a day. I, I ate once a day. I ate like a Chipotle bowl or something for dinner. And I was like, all right, back to studying or whatever. And it. like, I just, yeah. Wow. Okay. And it's, it's not blowing just, my it's mind. Not, it's not just <laughs> diet. It's like sleep. It's everything. It's and everything. we can turn back time. Yeah, Steven. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just going to blame it on Alex. It's that's, Alex's fault. Um, I, I, sorry, I just have one more question, you know, in terms of, so we're looking at, like, if you look at tennis at the moment, right, the three biggest stars uh, in the sport are all over the age of 35, I think, right? Djokovic is, what, 34, 35? Uh, Federer just turned 40. Um, Nadal is, like, 37, I want to say. Maybe, you know, he's, like, closer. He's a bit older than Djokovic. You know, you're seeing such an increase in longevity, right, when it comes to career, um, career like time span, mm -hmm. whereas before, like you go, you go thirty years ago, twenty years ago, people are retiring at like 25, oh, yeah. 26, 27. So you're seeing such an increase in longevity, not only in career though, but also in actual match time. Um, you know, so when it comes to like, what what would you say are the biggest factors that have contributed to that? You know, nutrition, but also in things that you've seen outside of nutrition, like things just as someone who's like a a, a you know a knowledgeable person when it comes to athletics um training you know recovery whether it be sleep what are some of the major things that you've seen that have allowed for that to happen yeah that's a really good question and um you know back to kind of some of the stuff we said right at the beginning which was you know it's it it is your full when this is your full-time job it has to be your full-time job so you know i will read about you know some of these elite marathon runners who sleep 10 hours a day um, who, you know, will sleep eight hours at night and take a two hour nap or, you know, sleep 10 hours, even all at once. So again, the more that we expend, the more we need to recover. So the, the key to longevity is recovery. It's not getting in as many workouts as I possibly can. It's not, and you'll probably hear that these athletes as they age do less but yet perform better right. because they've learned that, okay, doing these two day workouts, doing these, and you know, it's, it's just not sustainable as again, especially my joints, my muscles, my everything, you know, gets a little bit older. It's, it's harder to recover as someone who will be 47 next week. I know it's sorry. Shocking. Don't look over it. You don't look over a day 25. So let's not, let's not start complaining. I thought you just got out of college. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> no, but I, I tell you that. And I'm actually proud of my age because I do look pretty damn good for my age. Yeah. And I can say that because I work there damn you hard. At it. You, you know, like Reach. I get up at Oh, dark 30 to exercise on a daily basis. I put good things into my body. I prioritize sleep. I, you know, mon I, I moderate my stress. Like I do all these things because I want to be my best in this moment. And, and, you know, if you ask these, it's funny that you say that about tennis. I didn't even realize that until you said that, that like over 35, especially I would have said over 30, but, you know, often my, you know, my sport, my passion is, is the runners, the marathoners, but same thing in marathon running. Once they hit right. 30 is like when they hit their peak you know, 33, 34, you see some of these runners who, yeah, are hitting their peak in their, in their mid to, you know, mid thirties. Um, and so, so yeah, I would say number one is recovery. However, whatever that means to you. Yes. Obviously sleep is our number one recovery, but it's also, you know, doing things for yourself, like regular massage, like foam rolling, like, um, you know, compression boots, um, you know, those therapeutic massage gun things, um, you know, working mm -hmm. those muscles so that they're, you know, preventing injury, 
Um, you know, injuries can take you out at any period of time in your career. Um, most people who haven't made it to their mid thirties, it's because an injury got them. Um, and so, you know, as juniors, as collegiate players, as early pro players in their twenties, you know, that's what you have to really focus on is injury prevention and that's recovery. And part of recovery, of course, is nutrition and hydration and sleep, but it's also taking care of yourself in other ways too, and taking time off where, you know, there, as an athlete, you don't have really a specific vacation necessarily. Like my WWE athletes don't have a, a season, an mm. off season and an on season. You know, we're getting close to the off season for professional tennis right now, where the tournaments are starting to wind down. And then there's not much between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then boom, you know, Australia hits. Um, but, you know, th that's a time for them to, right. we call it preseason, where they might, you know, change their training a little bit or just take a little bit of time off right. so that they can let that that body recover a little bit. Tara, I have a personal question. How do you prioritize sleep if you're waking up at 4.30 in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I want to know. That's like, if you're waking up at 4.30 in the morning, how do you prioritize sleep? How's that? Well, let's just point out, I go to bed before my kids now. I am that okay. old lady. <laughs> I'm like, that. make sure you turn all the lights out. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm trusting that they're getting themselves to bed. Um, they're like teenagers now, you know, close to teenager. My youngest is 12 now. So, you know, they're, they're able to do that. But, um, but yeah, no, it is, it is discipline to, to make sure that I get myself to bed um, in order to get that up in the morning. So, you know, like I tell my athletes, I'm like, I don't get paid to exercise for a living like you guys do. <laughs> so I have to do it before my work day starts. Like I sit on my butt throughout the workday, as most people do, you know, sitting at a desk, emailing in meetings, da, 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 you know, whatever, like I spend the majority of my time sitting, talking to athletes throughout my day. And so I need to get my movement and my exercise in, in the morning, because I'm a morning person, it won't happen, you know, again, and especially once you have kids and all that, like I get home from work, it's dinner, it's homework, it's, da, 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 it's not going to happen in the evening for me. So that's why I've realized that if I'm going to prioritize exercise in my life for me personally, it needs to happen in the morning. Everybody has a different schedule. If you can, if you have a fitness center at work and you can do it in the middle of the day, great. You know, for us women, it's a little harder to beautify again if we <laughs> exercise in the middle of the day. Um, but, um, you know, you guys can just shower and go. Um, but, you know, so it's just, it's, it's finding that, that balance, you know, as you, as you go through different ages and stages in life and figuring out how, if it, if it is a priority to you, which it is to me, I have figured it out and it's been different in different ages and stages of my kids and career and all of that kind of stuff of when it will happen and how it will happen and how many days I can get in per week and that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, it, it all has to be that priority, just like nutrition has to be a priority where I prep, I plan, I figure it out so that I'm not just eating reactively and calling Uber Eats and, you know, figuring, uh, you know, right. getting getting meals on the fly, I bring my snacks with me, I bring my breakfast with me or eat my, you know, bring my lunch with me, that kind of stuff so that I can make sure that I'm getting it in. Well, Tara, I don't think you've reshaped the, the dietary habits of, of just our listeners. I mean, I think I'm going to be bringing baggies along with me like everywhere I go and I'm not even an athlete anymore. I mean, my mind is completely blown. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like, it's like do exactly the opposite of what you've been doing, but I'm definitely going to try it out. I recommend all of our listeners trying it out. Um, Tara, thank you so much. It, it's really been an honor and a privilege to have you on and thank you for educating us, uh, before. And, and, and for all our viewers. Um, but before we, before we go, if anybody wants to get in contact with you or maybe work with you, um, you know, we're definitely going to link, uh, your, your website in our bio. So everybody check out, check out the link. And, uh, yeah, what do you want well, to do you want to, do you want to talk about anything or mention anything before we wrap up? I know you got things going on. So yeah, I mean, you I, you know, as, as I've mentioned, I'm, I'm, you know, I work with the USTA WWE. Um, I also do some corporate work with Johnson and Johnson and, and teach their employees how to be healthier. Um, so, you know, I've got a couple of like gigs that I do on a regular basis, but I do have a little bit of time to take some individual clients as well. Um, and that's been, what's been nice about the pandemic is we've learned that Zoom is awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly.
to a point. I definitely have experienced Zoom fatigue um, when you're on so many Zoom calls a day, but I can work with athletes, you know, all over the country. I like to see athletes, at least in that initial call, so that I can see, you know, see that person and they can see me and all that kind of stuff. And then if we do just regular phone calls after that, I'm fine, but I prefer to do Zoom just because it brings that personal side of things in. So, you know, even if you're not here in um, Orlando, where I am, you know, I can definitely work with, with athletes of, of all kinds, um, you know, across the country um, or the world as well. So, um, so yeah, my website is dietdiva.net. And uh, my email is tara at dietdiva.net, super easy. So, um, so yeah, happy to, to help anyone out if you have any questions or want to work with me individually. Amazing. You're awesome. You're so <laughs> you cool. Are, yeah. you're, you're a hero. <laughs> Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Hey, it was super fun. I'm so glad. And I wish you the best with your podcast. I think Thank it's you. an awesome platform. Um, and I love podcasts. I was telling Alex when we, when he asked me to be on, I'm like, I am so into podcasts right now. <laughs> um, I just got a dog over the pandemic. And so like before I didn't really have, like, I, I just wasn't on the whole podcast or book on tape kind of thing. And so now I have a dog and like, I walk the dog for 30 minutes every morning. And so I pop a podcast. I like, I'm excited to get out there and like, listen to my podcast. Or if I have a longer drive, like I'll stick a podcast on. So um, love, love, love it. And uh, I'll definitely be listening to you guys with some of your other uh, guests and, and topics that you're talking about. Thank amazing. you. Thank, Thank you so much. See, this is why all of you have to subscribe because we get amazing guests like Tara on here <laughs> and, uh, and it's, it's as easy as clicking a button. So uh, stay healthy, stay happy. And as always, just slap. Take care, everybody. Thank you.